Thank you, Chris. Yeah, so I'm doing this kind of comparative project with a bunch of colleagues. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me. It's very nice to be here. Uh, we used to have our project office just there, and I was always in awe of Tuesday evenings, <laughs> the amount of people who were coming in, very varied kind of crowd. So it's great to be here. Um, yeah, so that having, having that office was because of this project that we're running on the comparative anthropology of revolutionary politics and really the, what the task of the project is. So I'm doing, I'm leading the project and I'm doing my bit of it in Cuba. I don't really believe in this project form so much having had to wear it. I don't, it doesn't suit me. Um, so basically I've got a bunch of people that work on in different parts of the world uh, in contexts which could be or self-define themselves as revolutionary in different senses in the Middle East and Latin America and so on. And my bit is to do Cuba but what we're collectively trying to do is to develop a kind of anthropological approach to the study of revolutionary politics. Right. So basically the kind of um, uh, motivation of the project was noticing this incredibly saturated field, the, stu the study of revolution, coterminous perhaps with the study of modernity itself, some would argue, right? Historians, political scientists, political philosophers, who hasn't written about revolution? But for anthropologists it has tended to be incidental, so you've got classic arguments like Max Gluckman's on rebellion and revolution and so on. You've got fantastic ethnographies like David Land's account of Zimbabwean Zandla freedom fighters, you know, uh, people who, uh, you know, there are such things, but there's no body of literature to which to turn, for example, when something like the Ar Arab Spring happens. Um, so when anthropologists want to talk about revolution, they don't have a kind of set of analytical frameworks and tools to work with other than incidental and there's been arguments about why that might be kind of prejudice for continuity thinking as opposed to break is one of the arguments that people have made uh, Joel Robbins and others and so on so anyway this is the context just so you understand why I talk about revolutions but what I'm going to talk about today is not nearly as grand as that we are actually writing a kind of survey book at the moment with with two of my colleagues but this is just a kind of account of what I tend to be take to be anthropologically interesting in the Cuban case that I'm looking at or one kind of starting point for developing an anthropology of the Cuban revolution. I'm afraid I'm going to read but I'm going to try and be lively in my reading. So there are two images from my ethnography of revolutionary Cuba that are somewhat haunting me as I go about writing it up and which in their relationship capture what I now imagine as the central puzzle of the book I want to write on the topic. So I'm at that, that stage of trying to kind of feel my way towards writing a monograph on this, right? The first is of an elderly lady sitting at a bench of Parque Central in downtown Havana within earshot of where I was standing waiting for a bus on a relentlessly sunny afternoon in August 2015. Even though the bench was in the shade, the woman was sweating desperately, and so was I and everyone else in the bus queue. Mechanically wiping her brow and chest with her handkerchief in that way Cubans have of performing their summer heat, the lady vocalized her desperation, speaking grumpy old woman style to herself or the world at large, not quite clear which. But what came out was not the standard comment on the heat one expects to hear in Cuba on hot days like that. Que calor, people will typically exclaim, as if to remonstrate with the airless atmosphere. Rather, the lady's tirade turned out to be political. When these guys, esta, esa gente, got rid of Batista, I was with them. Everything then was change. Todo era cambio. But holy mother of mine, madre mia, who would have known we'd still have them nailed there 50 years later? Ahí <laughs> clavados. No one can stand this. Eso no hay quien lo aguante. Uttered in a different context or by a different kind of person, these words would be, to use another Cuban heat metaphor, candela, which is to say too hot to handle, incendiary. In Cuba, saying things like that about the government in public is distinctly not okay. You can get arrested for it and have your card marked with the security services. But what has stayed with me is not the outspoken character of the old lady's words, but their profound ambiguity. This ambiguity, I think, is owing in large part to the odd match between the political content of the monologue and the meteorological connotations of the manner and context in which it was delivered. Indeed, if the woman felt she could say such a thing in public at all, that might be because the context of the heat and the pragmatics of her performance of it effectively merged the two levels, rendering them homologous. 
It is not just that the this of her statement, no one can stand this, rendered the heat an alibi for her complaint about the government. It is more that the, that the homology between the content and the context of the statement rendered the two as versions of each other. While the heat itself can be personified as an oppressive condition, political oppression a government that brought about revolutionary change only then to ensconce itself in power for nearly 60 years, can in turn be experienced as an objective condition that, like the Cuban heat or the Caribbean heat, can only be endured, something one must stand even if, as with the summer sun, no one really can. Politics then as weather. The other image that has been haunting me is from a conversation that took place in that same summer, though now in the fan-assisted cool of my shared office at the Institute of Philosophy of the Cuban Academy of Sciences, the elite government-sponsored research center where I was a visiting scholar during my fieldwork at the time. This was the time when the then still hard left-leaning government of Alexis Tsipras in Greece had called what to me seemed like an absurdly irresponsible referendum on the terms of, the, of Greece's European bailout. I'm from Greece myself, I'm half Greek, and I should say I'm not of the radical left. <laughs> So I had come into work quite furious about this and vent my own political frustrations, a little like the lady at the bus stop, out loud to myself and anyone who cared to listen. This was risky too, of course, since the Institute of Philosophy is very much at the heart of the Cuban government's continuing ideological project and consequently entirely favorable to Tsipras and his government. Still, as it turns out, my outburst produced one of the most vivid explanations of what it means to be a revolutionary or to be a revolutionary of the revolutionary hard left, so to speak, in Cuba. Having heard my grumbling, one of the senior and most charismatic researchers at the Institute came to my desk and illustrated my error by picking up my stapler. So this is what he said. Listen, my Greek friend, you think politics is like this. And he took the stapler and play acting with it like a kind of child might do with a toy car, dragged it slowly from the edge of the desk towards the center on a steady trajectory of movement. But revolutions are not like that. Revolutions are like this. So having rested the stapler on the, on the edge of the desk, he picks it up with an abrupt gesture and leaves it in the middle of the desk, right? Revolution, a revolutionary action is an impulse, a push. You can't know in advance where it will lead you, but you do it to change things. Everything changes. Once you're there, pointing to the stapler at the center of the desk, then you found out what needs to be done. I don't know if he was quoting Lenin, but sometimes that's what's needed. A push, a change, action. That's what your friend, your friend Tsipras is doing. We know uh, all about that here in Cuba. Right? So my two images, the old lady and the stapler, so to speak, are of course just anecdotes. But taken together, I think they illustrate a duality that runs deep in understanding not just how revolutionary politics operates, but also how it is experienced. The central puzzle, the way I see it, is this. If revolutions are par excellence understood as transformative eruptions, everything changes, as the philosopher at the Institute said, and everything is change, as the, in the old lady's words, then how are we to conceive of them when they become permanent conditions, as the lady's hot lament would have it? So that's basically the question that I'm trying to answer in this paper. The question, of course, is a very familiar one, not only from the social and political theory of revolution, but also as a concern for the protagonists of revolutions themselves. For example, the seemingly oxymoronic notion of permanent revolution, which broadly speaking addresses the problem of how to ensure that revolutionary product projects for radical change are carried through in the face of a host of stultifying and regressive conditions, has been a standard concern among Marxist theorists and leaders alike, from Marx himself to Trotsky famously, as well as Mao with the consequences we all know about. Conversely, the question of how to rein in the sweeping forces of revolutionary upheaval, as they're often imagined, once they've been successful in taking hold of the state apparatus, is also standard fare in the history of revolutions, Cuba included, of course, as we shall see. But to broaden out the discussion, and I noticed that you had some uh, discussion of early, or early Soviet art in, the, in this um, series earlier, I think. Um, I've been reading accounts of this problem in the aftermath of the October Revolution in the USSR, which illustrate the tension between change and permanence in a nigh emblematic way. So I'm, I'm really including the Soviet Union in order to show some really cool pictures, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, but I think they're relevant. 
So political histories of the first post-revolutionary years in Russia tend to focus on the institutionalization of the Bolsheviks' grip on power, including the famous tussles between Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin and other key, uh, leading figures to tell a story that marks an arc from an initial movement of violent effervescence that so famously shook the world through a period of intense and multifaceted transformations across the socio-political board, not just new economic relations and political structures, but also new horizons for education, gender relations, urbanism, the arts, and so on, which are then forcefully brought to heel as the 1920s progressed by Stalin's chilling bureaucratization of state power, creating the conditions for the terror of the 30s. While I can't go over this ground here, and I wouldn't dare since it's not my field, and I suspect there are people in this room who know much, much more about this than I do, and of course you can discuss it to your heart's content in the questions, uh, for purposes of the cosmologically based arguments in which, uh, I'll come, to which I'll come in a moment, I find most intriguing Susan Buck Morse's rather brilliant, in my opinion, account of the politics of the time in this connection. So focusing on the enormous burst of creativity that the revolution first co-opted and then precipitated in the field of the arts in particular, Buckmore suggests that what, the most, uh, sorry, that what was most deeply at stake in the fragile and increasingly fraught relationship between the Bolshevik, Bolshevik vanguard party, who called the shots, and the famously effervescent artistic avant-garde of the time, people like Malevich, Tatlin, Lizitsky, Stepanova, Rodachenko, etc. Yes, indeed. Was the construction of revolutionary time itself. This is Buck Morse's um, suggestion. So on the one hand we have an array of millennialist, avant-gardist and utopian visions expounded experimentally by artists convinced that in so doing they were enacting the art of revolution. While united by, and I quote, a desire to break radically with, a pa with past art in its traditional forms, end of quote, Buck Morse tells us, uh, Buck Morse tells us, for these artists, again I quote, what was to, co uh, to come remained an open category. As one of the many manifestos at the time put it, the future is our only goal. On the other hand, you have Lenin and then Stalin, for whom these artistic effusions were of interest only to the extent that they instantiated a more encompassing historical narrative of progress, namely the one uh, of the revolution as a proletarian achievement, guided towards its communist telos by the sure ha hand of the vanguard party in their charge. Thus, if the, every, if the everything is changed spirit of the artist was initially co-opted and to an extent institutionalized as revolutionary practice, for example through the notorious People's Commissar Commissariat for Enlightenment, as the 20s progressed it became increasingly hollowed out by the political leadership who asserted the progressivist temporality of revolution at the artist's expense. And this is the kind of stuff that started getting sanctioned. The diverse openings to a revolutionary future of Ryanists, uh, futurists, suprematists and, all, and other such avant-garde formations were thus closed down one by one and eclipsed by an institutionalized vision of art with the advent of state-endorsed socialist realism in the 1930s at once enacting and representing the progressivist temporal cosmology of the party. This is all, by the way, Buck Morse's argument, right? I find Buck Morse's central concern with revolutionary cosmologies highly suggestive, as I'll explain in a moment. But first I want to draw attention to the way in which her analysis pits the open currents of revolutionary effervescence and the closed forcefulness of, sub of subsequent institutionalization in opposition to each other. In so doing, I believe Buck Morse rather capitulates to an analytic tendency that is itself rather institutionalized in the study of revolutionary politics, and which was expressed most influentially perhaps by Max Weber in his famous discussion of charisma on the one hand and its routinization on the other. While again I'm no expert on this, I think it is significant that the part of Economy and Society, which is the title of the posthumous title of Weber's book, in which Weber's discussion of charisma appears, were written in the aftermath of the October Revolution in Russia, as well as the revolution in Germany itself at the end of the war, and are littered with anxious references to the actions of revolutionary socialists at the time. Certainly it is clear from the text that the populist attractions of revolution and how to bring them to heel were very much in Weber's mind when thinking of the power of charismatic authority to displace the legitimacy of established political orders. 
But that very power of revolution that for him is inherent in charismatic leadership is also what is most at risk when it is channeled into, into institutional forms of its own. If charisma must be routinized when its bearers come to occupy the, mach the machinery of government, it must thereby also dissipate and risk losing the ground of its original appeal. That's the famous problem that Weber was, was addressing. So the problem that my two anecdotes from Cuba set up can, be certainly be, can certainly be viewed as a version of Weber's problem of revolutionary charisma versus institutional routiniz routinization. However, my own argument here is motivated partly by a wish to overcome a basic normative assumption that Weber's typological contrast brings to the surface, an assumption that tends to underlie conceptions of revolution promulgated by theorists and protagonists alike. Namely, that the, that the idea that the hallmark of revolution has to be radical change and upheaval, so that when its transformational powers are in one way or other tempered, hemmed in cosmologically as for Buck Morse or routinized institutionally as for Weber, it must by definition lose its credentials as a genuine revolution and become something else. Right? The Trotskyite slogan, permanent revolution, captures this normative logic rather well. Since revolution is radical, uh, sorry, since revolution is radical change by definition, then all that could be permanent about it is, well, change itself. Right? Still, treating the question of what a revolution is, and indeed what it could be, in such a normative way may be more appropriate to political science, I would argue, or in theory, than to anthropology. As my two anecdotes illustrate, taken as an, ethnographic, as, as an ethnographic object rather than a political form defined a priori, revolutionary politics includes the question of what a revolution might even be, and more particularly how it might be understood as either a rupture or a permanent condition, or somehow both, which is kind of what's going on in Cuba, I think. Both for the lady in the heat and for the philosopher with a stapler, these are live questions. Asking, asking them is part of their experience of revolution. So treated ethnographically, in other words, revolutions are inherently reflexive. They ask questions about themselves. Were he not a Nazi, and I never want to forget that, I'd be tempted to put it in Heideggerian terms. Revolutionary being is being for which being revolutionary is an issue. This is kind of what Heidegger says about Dasein, doesn't matter if you don't know it. But anyway, it's a kind of reflexive way of being, right? A way of being that asks questions about itself. But a second, perhaps deeper ethnographic motive for extending the question of permanence into an anthropological study of revolution is that in Cuba, at least, the term itself, la revolución, is not only a prime object of concern for people, but, as it turns out, one that refers more to permanence than to rupture. Contrary to the idea that revolution is changed by definition, in Cuban common as well as political discourse, a clear distinction is made between the sequence of events that brought Fidel Castro to power in 1959, which even critics refer to formula formulaically as the triumph of the revolution, el triunfo de la revolución, and the total project of social, economic, political, and indeed moral transformation that these events back in 1959 set in train, which is what people, uh, which is what people refer to as the revolution, la revolución cubana. So taken as a proper noun then, in Cuba the term revolution denotes permanence deeply and abidingly. It is the project the country embarked upon all those years ago, el proyecto nacional, as official discourse often has it, and which is still ongoing, albeit severely ailing in all sorts of ways and confronting all sorts of obstacles, difficulties and compromises. Thus imagined, the revolution is ever unfolding, unfolding sorry, firmly moving forward towards victory, following that initial burst-like impulse my colleague illustrated with a stapler, until always, hasta siempre, and of course, that's, that's a really bad picture of Che Guevara's mausoleum in uh, Santa Clara, hasta la victoria siempre, right, classic Cuban slogan. 
which of course is not exclusive to Cuba, but I think Chair kind of took out copyright of it. Um, anyway, so this image then of revolution as an ever unfolding process takes me to my central proposal regarding the problem of how rupture and permanence can be correlated analytically to understand the advent of revolutionary politics in Cuba in the first instance, but given the nature of my argument perhaps more broadly as well. Namely, that the imminent relationship between rupture and permanence in revolution can be understood in the light of anthropological ways of conceiving the relationship between cosmogonies, so processes of cosmic creation, and the cosmological orders to which they give rise. So I want to transpose this kind of political problem about revolution and permanence and so on to a kind of classic anthropological terrain about cosmogonies and cosmologies and that kind of stuff, right? In a nutshell, uh, nutshell, I want to propose that there is some analytical mileage, uh, first of all, in thinking of the radical changes that revolutions like the Cuban bring about as processes of political cosmogony. The advantage of this way of thinking, I suggest, is that it makes it possible to transpose the question about rupture and permanence into a rather classical, though I shall try to show revealing, anthropological problematic about the relationship between, wait for it, nature and culture. So really classic stuff in anthropology. To the extent that in any given ethnographic circumstances what is taken to be natural is imminently related to what is taken to be cultural, quite obviously, this way of thinking allows us to understand revolution as rupture and revolution as permanent condition as functions of each other too. So I want to kind of correlate the nature-culture binary with the permanent rupture binary and make the two conditions of each other in the same way. So if nature-culture are uh, internally related to each other, and I'm relating the other binary to them, then re um, permanence and rupture must also be internally related rather than typologically distinguished like Weber did. So now, depending on how literal one wants to be about it, I think it may be uncontroversial to suggest that revolutions can be understood as cosmogonic acts. This is, the, of course, the great image that lent um, itself to become the cover of the, was it the Royal Academy that did the um, exhibition last year? Anyway, New Planet is the title. So, one of the distinguishing features of revolutions, after all, is that they aim explicitly to bring about a total socio-political transformation, changing the entire framework in which people's lives are lived. The goal of revolution, one might say, is not just to make changes in the world, but to bring about a new one. Certainly, the cosmological tenure of revolutionary discourse about making a new and better world in Cuba as elsewhere is so standard as to appear banal, as we also saw, saw so vividly in relation to the planetary proportions of the Soviet revolution's aspirations as described by Buck Morse and depicted by the early Soviet artists that she discusses. Speaking of the example of time, as she does, we may note that Cuba too has followed the telling revolutionary habit, so famous from the French case, of marking calendrically the cosmogonic character of its transformation. In official documents, including the daily press, each year since 1959 has been dated according to its distance from that initial time inaugurating event. So for example, at present, according to the legend of Granma, but unfortunately it's last year's here, so it doesn't matter. Um, so Granma is the Cuban version of Pravda, it's the, the kind of Communist Party's newspaper, which you don't have much choice, but you kind of have to read it. So according to its legend, this year or last year, we were traversing the 59th year of the revolution. Año 50 de la revolución, right? So that's part of dating in a kind of official Cuban document. So if I had a copy from this year, it would, it would have said 60, right? So now I've got a section where I actually talk about this very famous speech by Fidel Castro. I don't want to, uh, it, uh, I want to skip it over for reasons of time, but I wanted to, this is a super famous speech that Fidel gave in 1961 to, it's called Words to the Intellectuals, which people often uh, quote that, those bits that are in bold typeface, within the revolution, everything, against the revolution, nothing, right? And I take that to be actually a cosmological sh um, statement about, or I interpret this, 
uh, as a kind of cosmological statement about what it is, what the, what the shape of the re revolution as an entity is meant to be as far as Fidel Castro is concerned. And I pick out two crucial points, this idea of within the revolution everything, so this all-embracing nature of revolutionary projects, uh, and particularly the idea that they uh, behave as containers, right? So you're within a revolution, right? You're operating within the project, within dentro de la revolución, right? And the second idea which he kind of seeks to defend against its critics is he says that the revolution also has its rights, it says somewhere, right? And the key right that the revolution has is the right to exist and to develop. So this idea of revolution as a forward trajectory of movement that kind of encompasses everything as its own telos, right? So a kind of movement forward that realizes itself through this totalizing kind of current, as, it, as, you, as you like, the kind of totalizing movement forward, right? Which kind of corresponds to that initial statement by the old lady, everything was changed then, you know, this idea of forward moving, moving change, right? So, um, one of the things that I'm talking about in the bits that I'm skipping is, of course, how that image of a revolution as a containing, all-embracing, forward-moving current actually operated in the first years of revolution. And it's actually quite staggering, ju just as it was in the, in the Soviet case, how in the very first years in the early 1960s, so many things changed in almost like one fell swoop, like enormous transformations in Cuban society that people still, the kind of afterglow of that Big Bang, if you take my cosmogonic um, uh, idea seriously, is still felt. So people still talk about that time and its importance right, and, and the transformative effects that it had. And one of the key points that I make for my own argument, <laughs> it's a key point, is that this is not just changing stuff. So it's not just change, particularly through the auspices of the state, of course, as the prime agent of change, of bringing about change. But it's also, if you like, meta-change. And that's a really important idea for me. So it's not that a whole load of stuff changed in the early 1960s, but by the very, but the fact that the, by the very fact of changing it, the government showed that things that were previously taken to be immune to change could be changed. So if you take, for example, the uh, literacy campaigns, or the very one of the very first things that the government did was this massive literacy campaign throughout the island, which is still being used in all sorts of parts of America and Canada. It's being used in all sorts of places. Right? Um, Barack Obama stole it slogan. It's called uh, uh, Yes We Can, right? So that is the literacy campaign slogan. So the idea that these kind of almost surf-like peasants who were brutes, who were unable, who did not admit to, admit to education, right? Could the conditions of possibility for their education, their participation in the revolutionary project could be changed at the root by teaching them how to read is a great example of what I mean by meta-change. So you're affecting a change that changes the conditions of what can be changed, right? So it's a kind of double, if you like, level of change that is um, operative here, right? So how then, we may ask, are these dizzying heights of change and meta-change related to that um, uh, resounding sense of suffocating, suffocating stagnation that that old lady that I was talking about in the beginning was expressing at the at the bus stop. Now a conventional answer would just tell you the story of the of the revolution as an increasing story of relative stagnation and disappointment. I mean one of the key moments was the failure of the sugarcane harvest in 1969-70 where basically Che's whole image of a moral economy of um, um, altruistic new men who would without material incentive change the world came to a crashing halt because they failed to collect the amount of sugar canes that they had promised themselves to collect. The Soviet Union came crashing in from 1970 onwards and so began the 15 year period of the grey years when basically on a kind of uh, Stalinist model uh, the state socialism got institutionalized and became more and more stagnant and bureaucratized and stifling and so on. Right. So that would be a kind of conventional um, account of how from this moment of dizzying change and meta change we slowly ended up in the kind of stagnation kind of uh, I can't stand this anymore kind of feeling that the old lady was talking about right but I want to make a, a slightly I hope more interesting perhaps more less convincing argument so um, I just I don't just want to tell the historical story but make this anthropological kind of argument that I'm leading up to right 
So clues of a deeper relationship between the initial years of change and the current condition of stagnations become apparent, I want to suggest, when one places these historical developments that I just mentioned in the context of the more cosmologically minded take on revolution that I'm trying to develop. In this connection, the snippet of political cosmology implicit in the old lady's statement is of interest. And I'm going back to the initial statement. Since it links back directly to the cosmogonic image of revolution as an all-embracing change we found in Fidel's words to the intellectual speech. And this in two ways in particular. So let's go back to the... Oh, sorry, that was part of my account of the... So this says uh, of the... Um, the meta change argument. I, I love this slogan to fight against the impossible and win. Right? So you're fighting against what seemed to be impossible to change and you actually w win. You can win over that. So you can change the conditions of change. Sorry, that was the statement of by the old lady to which I want to return. So there's two ways in which I want to connect this to the kind of cosmological argument. The first concerns that demonstrative pronoun on which the ambiguity of her statement turns, namely the this that formed the target of her desperation. Esto no hay quien lo aguante. No one can stand this. Now this, esto, is not just any word here. Indeed, if the pronoun operates as a transistor of ambiguity between a comment on the weather and a comment on the government, that is because its latter sense is one that is entirely recognizable by Cubans. In the elaborate and elaborate uns elaborately unstated code of talking politics that has developed over the half century or more uh, that the lady was lamenting, a code that operates as much with gestures as with words. So for example, in Cuba, if you want to refer to the government, you just go like that and everyone knows what you're meaning. Right? If you want to refer to Fidel in the old days, you just went like that and everyone knows what you're meaning. Or you'd say, my uncle, mi tío, that meant Fidel Castro. Right? So, um, in that code, esto is a signifier heav heavily freighted with political meaning. Deploying the floating grammatical quality of the pronoun, it is coextensive in its form with the revolution itself, with the country, with society, with the state, indeed with the state we're in. Esto, people will say, sometime, or sometimes la cosa, the thing, at times gesturing with their hand towards the whole horizon of space around them, and mean by it all that taken together, the political condition at large, to which the project of revolution most explicitly sought first to give birth and then establish and solidify as an all-embracing transformation. In the light of my earlier discussion of Fidel's famous speech then, I would suggest that esto is simply what his everything, todo, i.e. the all-containing revolution, looks like when it is experienced from the inside. Something by which one is so thoroughly contained as to feel suffocated by it. Inside it, yes, but not necessarily part of it, though always already conditioned by it, exactly as Fidel had warned those intellectuals from the start. I mean, it doesn't matter. The second and more overtly cosmological feature of the lady's pronouncement has to do, of course, with its performative elision of politics and the weather that I mentioned earlier. <coughs> what is most significant here is not so much whether the elision was intentional or the fact that it was critical of the government, but rather the homology it assumes between esto, this, and weather as conditions one can only endure. And note how symmetrically this inverts the image of revolution presented by the philosopher with the stapler. If for him the totalizing change of everything that revolutions bring about is a project of concerted, indeed courageous, human action, what Cubans know how to do and Tsipras was just trying out, for her it's just the opposite. Total and all-embracing like the weather, indeed, but like the weather too, constitutively out of her human control and everything that's everywhere, ineluctable and relentless, just like the revolutionary imagery of hasta siempre would have it, only instead of being produced, it's the thing that can only be endured. Furthermore, the inverse symmetry with the philosopher's statement pertains to the question of change, also what I highlighted earlier. If in the early revolution um, everything was change, as she said, the complaint about the, surra the, the surrounding esto now is partly that it is so stuck, with the Castro brothers nailed up there for over, over 50 years, as she put it. Esto then is unbearable, not only because it's what the everything of revolution feels like when you're caught inside it, 
but also because it's what that everything becomes when its inner momentum as a current of change has long since dip dissipated into stagnation. Now again, a straightforward commentary on this contrast between active change and passive stagnation would quite rightly say that it corresponds simply to the opposing roles of, tho of those who are in charge of the revolutionary project process, whether in practice, the, the Castro's, the state machinery, or in theory, a philosopher with a stapler defending it conceptually. So on the one hand, those who run the revolution, if you like, and those who over more than half a century have found themselves on the receiving end of its institutionalization the old lady and just about everyone I assume who was in that bus queuing listening and knowing exactly what she was talking about. The revolution looks like an action if you're doing it and like a condition if you're having it done to you. But again as with Buck Morse and Max Weber uh, the problem with this level-headed approach is that it passes change and permanence apart distributing them, in this case, to different constituents of the revolutionary process, rather than really understanding them as functions of one another within the coordinates of a single analytical framework, which is what I'm trying to argue for. Now, I've only begun to develop such a framework for the book, right? So this is coming with a major kind of um, speculative warning. Um, but I want to close by suggesting that the conundrum regarding the relationship between revolution as unfolding change and revolution as permanent condition can be seen fruitfully in the light of the arc anthropological concern with the varied ways in which the distinction between nature and culture can be conceived in different ethnographic settings. So this is basically the bit where I'm trying out an argument and you can tell me what you think. Indeed, in the light of the foregoing discussion, of particular relevant relevance here is Roy Wagner's powerful idea. This is, for those of you who don't know him, an American um, anthropologist who works in, in Papua New Guinea and has worked there since the 60s. He's quite elderly now, but quite a, a bit of a shamanic genius, in my opinion. Some people think he's a bit of a charlatan. He loves uh, Castaneda and... Don Juan and all that. So if you don't like that kind of stuff, you won't like Roy Wagner, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't actually like Castaneda, but I love Roy Wagner, so you can like one and not the other. Anyway, so in, the, in light of the foregoing discussion, of particular relevance here is Roy Wagner's powerful idea that this variation of um, how people set up the distinction between nature and culture can itself be tracked conceptually with reference to the way people in different settings distinguish between aspects of their lives they take as given. So this is a major... Uh, argument that Roy Wagner makes. So to understand how people pass nature and culture in different set settings, we have to understand in, in terms of the distinction people make between things that they take to be given, which he calls artificial, um, sorry, which he calls innate, sorry, and aspects which they deem themselves responsible for making, right, which he calls artificial. So you've got the innate stuff, which is given, and the stuff that you're responsible for, which is, which is uh, artificial. So briefly for Wagner, one particular way of conceiving the distinction between nature and culture, and that's a very particular way, which anthropologists, however, have long taken for granted as part of the human condition at large, and this might be an interesting point of discussion with, with Chris, uh, has been to take the former nature as innate and the latter culture as artificial. But to show that anthropologists have been wrong to take this for granted, Wagner counterposes ethnographic examples from Melanesia to show that for people there, the kinds of things that anthropologists take as cultural are taken as innate, as part of the given order of things, while the stuff that we take as natural are treated as artificial, things that it is our responsibility to strive to achieve. So, for example, the anthropologist takes social structures, norms and rules as human-made culture. While things like the weather, note, or indeed our own drives as an animal species, are the innate natural conditions these cultural conventions, as we sometimes call them, seek to bring under control. By contrast, that's what anthropologists think, right? By contrast, Melanesians take social structures, norms and rules for granted as innate conditions beyond human control, while the field we call nature is for them animated by entities and forces with which humans can engage in, relationship, in relationships and influence through ritual actions, including witchcraft and sorcery, right? So, to put it extremely crudely, rainmaking. It's not a very Melanesian thing, it's more Southern African or whatever, but that's 
deemed to be natural, right, beyond our human control, notwithstanding the Anthropocene and all that. And that's, I guess, why the anthrop Anthropocene idea is interesting, because it goes against that, right? Whereas for, I don't know, Shona people in Zimbabwe or whatever, rainmaking is a human activity, right? Etc. right? Uh, <clears throat> good. So in terms of this matrix, so he's kind of destabilizing the distinction between nature and culture, as Marilyn Suthern has also done, and many other people, whatever. In terms of this matrix then, the relatively uncontroversial, and I'm really finishing in very quickly, in terms of this matrix then, the relatively uncontroversial starting point would be to pass the idea of revolution as concerted human action, right? A momentous push that changes everything, as an example of what we would already assume, namely an exemplary human project of changing the social order, which is the proper domain of human artifice against the background of innate natural conditions. I've made a little diagram of my argument here. I don't know if it's in any way uh, useful, but you can follow the visual while I talk. <coughs> so, if anything distinguishes revolutionary action, as we've seen, it is the radical manner in which it is able to change the very scope of human action. It's an action that changes the scope of action. So, to reiterate the philosopher's illustration with a stapler, what makes revolutions different from the liberal forms of politics against which it is pitted is the speed and ferocity with which its project of social transformation and control is pursued, such that everything changes and everything is changed. But what makes revolutions so radical in this respect, as I've suggested, is that they deliberately disturb the balance between what can legitimately be treated as artificial, culture in our terms, and what must be taken as innate, nature in our terms. While the statement everything is changed may not be meant as a literal claim about each and every constituent of the universe, to be sure, it nevertheless draws attention to the possibility of a radical shift in that direction. Where the ancien regime presents itself as the natural order of things, natural order of things, the radical and indeed critical role of the revolution is to unmask it as a human-made imposition and thus render it open to drastic and radical change. So in the more abstract terms in which Wagner's distinction operates, the field of the artificial, which we call culture, expands, while that of the innate, so that's the arrow there, which we deem to be natural, contracts, such that things previously taken as given are now taken on as projects of human endeavour. Hence also the compelling idea, by the way, which Buck Morse and Reinhard Koselleck share, though not Weber, interestingly, that revolution is an avatar of modernity, not to, to say high modernism. So for, for both um, Buck Morse and Koselleck revolution, and actually for Hannah Arendt as well, is the apogee of, of, of modernity, really. Uh, really. So, you know, if for Wagner that, this, this, that way of mapping culture and nature is the way moderns think, it makes sense that revolution would, would radicalize that way of thinking precisely. So, okay, but then the question arises, final paragraph. What, uh, sorry, might this destabilization of the distinction between the innate and the artificial also work the other way to account for what looks like the diametrically opposed idea articulated by the old lady, namely of the revolution becoming as natural as the weather? Certainly in terms of Wagner's matrix, the old lady's lament seems to invert the redistribu redistribution of the innate and the artificial, such that a revolution that presents itself as an artificial project of human action ends up getting treated as an unbudgeably innate condition, marking a regression, so to speak, from culture back to nature, or better, through culture into a kind of second nature. And of course, there's this whole lit literature on second nature, which we could also go into if you want. With nature understood here in Wagner's anthropological terms, not in the philosophical terms of Hegel and what have you, as the tendency to treat as innate what was previously brought into being by human artifice. So what I find attractive about this is that it renders the experience of revolution as an innate condition a function, logically speaking, of its initial character as a human project. The deepest force of revolutionary transformation, as I've suggested, resides in revealing things that seem given as things that can actually be changed. But that transformation, as the philosopher illustrated so vividly with a stapler, requires energy. It's what the revolution does when it pushes forward, 
Once that push has been performed, however, and things become so static as to seem nailed in the old lady's image, then the inimical quality of the innate is able to reassert itself, only now operating on that very order that sought to dissolve it in the first place. So that bit here, right? In short, if revolutionary action consists in turning the innate into human artifice, then when its initial cosmogonic energy relents, then its artificial product, the new social, economic and moral order it installed and institutionalized, can itself regain the quality of the innate, and in that sense become second nature, conflated ambiguously with the weather. The sense of suffocating permanence of this, esto, that the old lady was conveying, can be conceived as a consequence of the very ca character of the meta-change of changes that brought it into being in the first place. A sense of encroaching permanence experienced as innateness then becomes part of the inner dynamic of revolution rather than an external reaction against it. And that's really what I'm, all I'm trying to say, is that stagnating revolutions are the way they are because they're revolutions, not because they stop being revolutions. Right? So it's, you don't only have to constantly change in order to have permanent revolution, as a Trotskyite might say, they want, or as Trotsky said. Or That's it.